Hallelujah. <laughs> Today we're going to continue our study of the book of Luke. Last week we're in chapter 20. This is called the temple section of the book of Luke. The title of today's lesson is simply the Olivet Discourse. This is the message that Jesus preached on the Mount of Olives after he'd come into Jerusalem in the triumphal procession and, of course, before his crucifixion. For most of you are aware that the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels. In other words, they cover generally the same material. And so in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, we have the record of the Olivet Discourse. And of course, in Mark 13, the same. Now, when you really get into this, a lot of people try to stay away from this particular passage because in their minds, it's very confusing. And yet, when you break it on down, it's absolutely fascinating. Because here is Jesus' last full sermon before he goes to the cross. And he's going to deal with two very essential things. He's going to talk about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, thus the judgment against the Jewish nation. And at the same time, he's going to parallel that to the judgment of the entire world. And of course, then, his second coming. Now... In order to get a running start into the Olivet Discourse, we're going to do a little study right at the end of Luke chapter 20. As Luke foreshadows the words of Jesus by recording the actions of the many Pharisees and, of course, one poor widow. Let's get to our text, chapter 20. Beginning in verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Let me tell you something. Jesus laid it out against the Jewish leadership right here. And he says, these guys are just out for themselves. They're just out to make a show. As a matter of fact, their lives are so full of greed, they're taking the poor widow's sacrifice and using it for their grandeur. And Jesus says, listen, they may have long and lengthy and showy prayers, but let me tell you something, these men are going to be punished very severely. So in contrast, we read this. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts in the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. You know, this is a fascinating passage right here, because back in that time, it was somewhat a custom that when someone would place their gift in the temple offering, they would announce what the gift was. Now that'll make a few people think. And when you have all these rich people putting in their gifts, it's announced, wow, boy, they gave that much. Oh man, they gave that much. And Jesus says, hey, don't let the outward facade fake you out. It's really not a matter of portion, but proportion. You see, the Bible says right here that this poor widow put in two very small copper coins. The name of that coin is called a lepton, and it is not worth very much. It's worth about one-eighth of a penny. And so she puts in a quarter of a penny into the contribution for God. But the Greek right here is very fascinating. Our translation right here in verse 4 is that she put in all she had to live on, the actual Greek is she put in her bios. She put in her life. She gave her entire life to God. That's what a sold out disciple is. Amen, guys? Amen. What a contrast to the Pharisees who make such a great outward show of their religion and yet inside are empty and dead. You know, appearances can be deceiving. Reminds me of the story about the Olympic gymnast. 
and he couldn't find a job. So he went to the circus and said, oh, surely I'd be able to get hired out at the circus. Well, he goes, he goes to the circus, and there's no openings for any acrobats. And so the guy goes, you know something? You know, we, we don't have an opening for an acrobat, but, you know, our gorilla just died yesterday. And we have an old gorilla suit. And in the meantime, hey, how would you like to play a gorilla? I mean, you're kind of acrobatic and athletic and everything. Guy goes, well, I don't have any choice. So he dons the gorilla outfit and he goes into the cage. And, and to his surprise, a lot of people came to see him. And he started to get a little fired up about his job, you know. And so he had a little rope in the cage. It was an open top cage. And he climbed up the rope and people were getting all fired up. And then the crowds got bigger when he started to swing on the rope. Because when he swung on the rope over and out of his cage, it swung over the lion's cage. Which also was open. So the more he swung out, the more the crowds came. Well, one day he was swinging and the rope snapped. He fell into the lion's cage and he starts yelling, help, help. And then the lion said, shut up or you'll get us both fired. <laughs> you see, appearances can be deceiving. Are you with me here, church? We can look one way on the outside, but that's really not who we are on the inside. Now, let's get to the Olivet Discourse. Remember, so many people are afraid of this passage. We need to approach it with ravenous delight that we're going to get something new out of this passage. It's going to speak to us today. Remember, it's a very simple formula. Jesus is going to address two themes. The end of the Jewish nation, 70 AD, when Titus totally destroys Jerusalem. That's the judgment against the Jews. And then at the same time, he's going to parallel that to his second coming and the judgment of the entire world. Amen? Let's get into it. So right after this episode with the Pharisees and the poor widow and the foreshadowing of the fact that appearances are not everything, that in fact they're very deceiving, we read this in verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus says, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? We talked about it last week. The original temple was built by Solomon in the 10th century, and it was an incredible structure, kind of, if you will, baptized in gold. There was nothing like it in the entire known world. Many years later, it's completely and utterly destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar as the Jews are taken into captivity into Babylon. Well, then the remnant comes on back and rebuilds the temple in about 516. That's Zerubbabel's temple. But, of course, the remnant was very poor, and so the temple, though it had the same construction, was a very modest building. Well, many hundreds of years passed, we come down to Jesus' time, and, and Herod the Great says, man, we've got to really make the temple beautiful. And so Herod the Great sets out on a 30-year renovation project to beautify the temple, because for the Jew, the temple represented how they stood with God. And so what Herod did was pretty amazing. He brought marble stones 70 feet long, 12 feet wide, and 12 feet high. Can you imagine the size of these stones? Dazzling white. And we did the entire outside of the temple. He quadrupled the size of the temple area itself. And then when it says right here, there, there were beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, what these were were the silver and the gold that was given to God, and it was hammered into the gates and the doors of the temple itself. Tacitus, one of the most well-known Roman historians, just said, I was in awe of the immensity of its opulence. He said it was one of the most awesome buildings in all the world. And so if you're a Jew, you look at the temple and you go, it's dazzling. It's cranking. And so, spiritually speaking, we must be cranking. 
We must be doing awesome because look at the marble. Look at the gold. Look at the silver. And Jesus goes, guys, don't get too awed about the grandeur of this structure. It's going to come a time when one stone's not going to be left upon another. It's going to be completely leveled. They said, well, when is this going to happen, Jesus? And what will be the signs that this happens? Now, he answers, as I said, in two ways. Because for Jesus, there's the judgment of the Jewish nation. And then there is the judgment of the entire world. Amen? Let's plunge into it. And I think you'll be able to pick up which he talks about when. Verse 8. He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. So right now he's talking about the last few days before the end of the Jewish nation. Do you see that right there? Now watch this, verse 10. Then, he says to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. So now we're talking about all the earth and all the heavens. So now this is talking about the end of the world, the second coming of Jesus. Let's keep going. Verse 12. So notice how one mirrors the other. The same sort of events happen before the judgment of the Jews and before the judgment of the entire world. Verse 12. But before all of this, so once more, we're back to that generation. You see it. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors and on all account of my name. This result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand. How are you going to defend yourselves? For I will give you the words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. And they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. Okay. When I write here, he's talking about the events that precede the end of Jerusalem. The judgment of the Jewish nation. He's saying, bottom line, following me is not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. He says, but when you get persecuted, remember, persecution is going to bring you before the kings and the governors, and that's going to give you an opportunity to talk about the kingdom and to share your faith. He says, don't have any anxiety because you need to set your mind ahead of time. That persecution is going to come. And that God will give you the exact words to say. And remember, even from your own family, parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, some of these people are going to put you to death. He says, I don't want you to be romanticizing necessarily that every aunt, uncle, grandpa, grandma, son, daughter, nephew, niece is going to come around. He says, I want you to understand, some of these people are going to hate you so much, they're going to kill you. Wow. He says, bottom line, he says, not a hair of your head is going to perish. Well, of course, he wasn't talking about on this earth. He just talked about the fact they were going to die. But the whole point is, if you stay firm to the end, you get life eternal. Amen, guys? Now, let's move on. Verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Now that, that's kind of a given. You know, when get all the armies around Jerusalem, the end is about to come. Then let those who in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that's been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. They will be in great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Wow. Josephus, perhaps the most well-known of all the Jewish historians, tells us about Titus' 
desolation, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The population of the city was about 1.2 million people. 1.1 were slaughtered. The remainder, 97,000, were taken into captivity and placed as slaves all around the different nations in the Roman Empire. When Jesus talks about desolation, he means desolation. These words right here, how dreadful it will be in those days for a pregnant woman or a nursing mom. When the armies came around Jerusalem, they laid, as custom in that day, siege to the city. The whole idea was to, quote, get the city to use all of its resources, especially food, and therefore to starve it in a submission. This is exactly what Josephus said happened. It got so bad that the Jews were even eating little babies. All the words of Jesus are true. How dreadful it will be for a pregnant woman or for a nursing mom. We need your kid to eat. It's that desperate. It's that dreadful. Then he says, Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles. And that's exactly what happened by the Romans' empires. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Little note right here. All that means is the time of the Gentiles. I mean, this is when the, of course, Gentiles are dominant. Of course, this happens all the rest of the time. Well, it comes to fulfillment. Paul talks about that, if you want to go study it, in Romans chapter 11. And he says, well, until all the full number of Gentiles come on in, then Israel will be saved. So we find right here that both Luke and Paul hold out hope that even though there's judgment against the Jewish nation, there's still going to be a few Jews that are going to be saved. Amen, guys? Okay, now, we've just seen now the end of Jerusalem, the judgment against the Jewish nation. So now what's going to be mirrored? It's going to be the judgment of the end of the world and Jesus' second coming. Watch this. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. So, above the whole world, right? On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint with terror. Man, it's just going to be too much. It's going to be that dreadful at the end. Apprehensible what's coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up. And lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus was giving the saints hope. Amen? Amen. Now, we remember the reference of Son of Man all the way through the book of Luke. And, of course, that comes from the book of Daniel. Let's get on over there and remember what he's referencing. Remember, for the Jew, when he hears the Son of Man, he's going to remember Daniel chapter 7. Let's get on over there quickly. These are the words of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. That will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And the church said, Amen. Wow. So when Jesus references this, the disciples are going, Oh man, Daniel 7, there's going to be a day when all the saved people of all the nations of all time are going to be drawn up to the Son of Man. And all of them are going to worship him in everlasting kingdom. Does that fire you on up right here? <laughs> now look what he says. Verse 29, he told him this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus talks about a very simple parable that I think we can all understand. He's talking about that dramatic and dazzling time 
that the trees in the spring, right before the summer, which are barren branches, just miraculously sprout green leaves. You got to admit, spring is a cranking time. I mean, it is amazing to see seemingly a dead tree come to life. He says, it's going to be that clear of sign that when we see the leaves come on out, the time of judgment is coming. Now, look at what he says, though. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Well, the fig tree represents the Jewish nation. And of course, all the trees represent all the nations. And so he says, hey, this judgment, it's going to be clear when it comes upon the Jewish nation there in 70 AD with Titus. With all the nations, it's going to become clear at the end when Jesus comes again as the Son of Man with all of his glory. Amen, guys? And then he says, and this is perplexed people, in verse 32, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, that confuses some people because they think, well, now, all these things happen. Okay, sure, the... The idea of Jesus lives in about 30 A.D. and destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., so that's that generation. But how about the second coming of Jesus? That's not come yet. Well, Jesus' point is everything is paralleling. So he's saying all these kind of events are going to come in this generation, and then Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. He says, let me be clear. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never change. So what are we to do? Well, verse 34, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple And each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. Man, they couldn't wait to be and hear the Lord. Amen, guys? I simply have two points for us this morning. The first comes from where Jesus talks about the fact in verse 8, Watch out that you are not deceived. My first point is simply this, deception in this generation. Deception in this generation. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11 would have been in that generation. And we're going to see what began to happen to the church by the mid-50s A.D. Remember the church starts about 30, 33 A.D., And by the mid-50s, we find this has begun to happen. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, a church that he had planted. He writes in verse 1, I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness, but you've already been doing that. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present to you a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I don't think that I'm the least inferior to those super apostles. Verse 13. For such men are false apostles. Deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Woo! Man, we thought Jesus was laying it out. Paul right here lays it out. He says, man, as your father in the faith, I wanted to present you, church, as a pure virgin bride to Jesus on the last day. But you know something? 
Instead of being a pure virgin bride, you were just like Eve. So easily deceived. Someone comes and preaches a different Jesus and you go along with it. Someone comes with a different spirit and you just go with the flow. Someone comes with a different gospel and you put up with it easily enough. He says, let me lay it out. These guys that preach a different Jesus, these guys that preach with a different spirit, these guys that preach a different gospel, they're deceitful workmen. Now, what was the warning that Jesus was giving? Do not get deceived. Who were these guys? These were preachers that in their minds thought they were preaching the right thing because they themselves were deceived. And the Bible says quite clearly right here that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. You know, it occurs to me that it's been good for us to have this study in the book of Luke. And if I can't say it's been good for us, it's been good for me. <laughs> because, I mean, to tell you, Luke lays out who Jesus is. Jesus is the man that is going to die not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, so the whole world can be saved. Jesus said, it is my mission to seek and save the lost, for that is why I've come. Our Jesus called people to a total commitment, whether it's the widow that gave her bios her whole life, or he lays it out with the rich young ruler who was pretty moral, but didn't want to give up everything and let him walk away. Our Jesus not only preached the lost, but focused his life on discipling. He poured his life into those 12 men, understanding that the hope of the entire world rested on them, making disciples who could make disciples who could make disciples. That's the Jesus that Luke portrays to us. Let me ask you this. Is that your Jesus? If it's not your Jesus, you need to repent. See, because I think a lot of us put up with a different Jesus quite easily enough. We put up with a Jesus that's kind of fuzzy about who's lost and who's saved. We put up with a Jesus who's kind of fuzzy about how much commitment you need to have. We put up with a Jesus that doesn't know whether discipling is, is commanded or optional. We put up with a Jesus that can let you come whenever you want. If you want to stop by services on Sunday, that's fine. If you don't, well, Godspeed. Let me tell you something. Paul was flat ticked off by the false Jesuses that were preached. Why? Because it led to the damnation of those who accepted a false Jesus too easily. A different gospel. I understand this. I, I, my, my parents, neither one of them believed in Jesus. And so I grew up just kind of believing in God and Jesus. And, and then some people reached out to me very sincerely. And they tried to teach me how to become a Christian. They turned to Revelation 3.20 and said, hey, all you need to do to become a Christian is just say a prayer and Jesus will come into your life. But you know something? I found out a few years later, that's not really looking at that scripture in context. That scripture is talking to Christians that have become lukewarm. See, the Bible is very clear about who is saved and who is not. See, the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 2. The book of Luke lays it out. Jesus is the Son of God. Period. Peter, in his message of verse 36 of chapter 2, lays it out. He says, Therefore, Lord, others will be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter accuses everyone in that audience 
of crucifying Jesus. Why? Because they'd all sinned. Look at the response. When the people heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. Those who accepted this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day, and they devoted themselves. The apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. They became baptized disciples. Amen? Amen. You see, there's a lot of different gospels about salvation that are preached today. There's a millions of people that believe very sincerely that all you have to do is to be baptized as a little baby, just sprinkled, and you're good to go for the rest of your life. And you know something, if you ask someone, hey, do you remember your baptism? I've yet to hear anybody remembers. And most babies don't want to get baptized anyway. (laughs) So if you don't want to be baptized, but you're getting wet, I mean, you know. There's an equally large number, literally hundreds of millions of people that likewise believe, like I was taught, that all you have to do is just say a prayer and you become a Christian. I was very sincere, but I am so thankful that someone opened the scripture. It was a fraternity brother, a true disciple that opened the scripture to me. And you know, some of the amazing thing was when I first saw it, I was ticked off. And I said, are you saying that I am lost? And the guy goes, exactly. I go, okay, I just want to know. (laughs) I I had to wrestle with this. This This is what I taught. This is what I felt. I said that prayer and I felt saved. But you know, feelings are not necessarily equated with the truth. I'll tell you something. After that study, I stayed up almost all night. Didn't go to classes for part of my classes the next day. Came back, and and I said, okay, we got to study more about this. After studying a couple more hours, Monday night at 1.30 in the morning, I was baptized into Jesus Christ. And you know something? That time I was sure that I'd become a Christian. Why? Because I had the scriptures. And I understand that not one word of scripture is going to change. See, there are a lot of people even now, perhaps even in our membership, that think, well, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe God will change who's saved and who's lost when we get up to heaven. He'll get, he'll get extra generous. And, and some of the people that didn't believe in Jesus, some of the people that had good thoughts, or, you know, some of the people prayed Jesus in their heart, maybe they'll get on in. Let me tell you something. If the word of God is not going to change, it's not going to change. And we better get a conviction about who is saved and who is lost if we're going to be like Jesus. Because Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. Are you with me right here? You know, a couple that uh, is just an incredible inspiration to me is uh, Matt and Helen Sullivan. For those that are visiting today, we support them as missionaries down in Santiago, Chile. And Matt and Helen just left on down there a couple months ago. And uh, Helen was fluent in Spanish, but uh, Matt was not. Praise God, last two weeks he's been preaching his sermons in Spanish. Is that awesome? Well, when they went on down, they prayed, God, put us in an apartment building where someone is going to become a Christian. So they searched all around and They made a decision for various reasons. And the very first day in going into the building, there was a doorman there. His name was Aurelio. And Matt, in his very humble Spanish, tried to share his faith with him. And he learned after a few days of five-minute conversations that Aurelio was a very sincere man. For 18 years, he'd been studying his Bible every day. And he studied himself out of infant baptism. He goes, well, that that, that can't be right. And yet he, he understood that, well, yeah, you have to make an adult decision to be a Christian. But when Matt came by, he just had to ask the question, well, what? What does it take to really follow Jesus and be saved? And praise God, the Spanish and the English read the same. And Matt was able to study with him. And he was baptized two weeks ago. Amen, guys? See, that's, that's, that's exciting. 
You know, I forgot who said it up here, but you know, one of the things I, I really believe in is the public confession of Jesus as Lord. See, we do that when we're baptized, and we're supposed to do that every day for the rest of our lives. With our life and with our actions, we say, Jesus is Lord. And so when some fall by the side, and they no longer proclaim Jesus as Lord, and perhaps they fall asleep, or they even go so far as to fall away, as Steve did. And I appreciate Steve's tears. Wow. It takes a lot of guts to say, hold it. I was a disciple. And I got deceived by the world. And fell away. Wow. It takes a lot of guts. Like Mike say, listen, you know some. I went to ch- I, I, I didn't I never stopped going to church. But I fell asleep. I fell away in the church. I was asleep in the light. That takes guts. You know, we're at church. You're going to find that strives to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we're not a perfect church. You say, well, why is that? Well, because you and I are in it. But just some weird church that wants our brothers and sisters not to live a double life. Because <clears throat> living a double life deceives us. We begin even to think it's okay. I, I appreciate so much the brothers up in the North region at the midweek service bringing a dear brother up before the church, Pete, to the third step of church discipline. And perhaps you don't know church discipline. It's four steps. You go to person one-on-one if they've sinned. That's step one. Then you go two or three on one and try to get them to change. That's step two. If they don't change there, then you bring them before the church. That's not this fellowship, man. That's just trying to get the church to say, man, we need to love up on this guy or this gal so they'll repent. And if they still don't repent, then you disfellowship. And I I appreciated Pete because he went to church uh, Wednesday night. And we laid it out for the church that, that Pete was unrepentant about pornography. And there are a lot of people that minimize pornography. It is impurity. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 and following, it says, man, if you're impure, it's an idol. And if you don't repent, you're going to hell. It's nothing to be messed around with. And I appreciate the brothers in this church that don't mess around. Now, I know of no brother that hasn't sinned in the area of lust. But so that's the value of grace, is that... We receive the forgiveness of God to the point where in love, we can try to gently restore one another to the Lord. Because see, we don't want to get our brothers or sisters deceived. See, the Jesus we follow is a Jesus that's transparent. A Jesus that wants all sin to come out of us. And we need to be that kind of brother and sister in Christ to one another. Are you with me right here? And so, bottom line church, let's take the charge. Deception in this generation, let's watch out. Just like Jesus said. Because with deception comes condemnation. Our second point is proclamation in this generation. Let's get back to our passage in Luke. I sure hope that you're going to take the time To go back into this text because there's just so much here, guys, that's exciting about the double judgment. Everything from the fig tree and then all the trees to the judgment simply of Jerusalem and the desolation of it to the desolation of the entire world. I mean, it's pretty clear. And in some ways, it should put a little fear in you. You know, whenever you get convicted of sin, you should get fear. I mean, the other night, about three nights ago, I, I had a weird dream. First of all, I dreamed I was a college student. That was, that was certainly a dream. That was, that was a wild dream. And I'm sitting there in my dream, and I, and I go up to this really cute girl. And I, I go, and, and, uh, and I, I don't know why in the dream, but she was the, the star tennis player. And I said, what's your name? And she said, Natalie. I don't, I don't even know a Natalie. And she goes, don't you remember, I, I, I won the NCAAs. And I, and I lied. I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, 
can I have your number? And she goes, this is in the dream. I thought you were a Christian. I swear to God, I woke up. I was shaking like this. I was going, oh, whoa, man. I almost sinned in my dream. I mean, I don't, have you ever had that happen to you? I mean, you wake up, oh, man, scared. But the temptation and the sin, even in a dream, it's frightening. But right here, Jesus wants to, he wants disciples to know what they're in for. Come on, yeah. In verse 10, uh, verse 12 of chapter 21, he says, Before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. This will result in you being witnesses to them. Wow. Guys, every time we're persecuted, that's awesome. That gives us the chance to proclaim Christ. You know, I shared with you that the parallel passage in the other synoptic gospels was in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and 25. Let's look at both of them. Mark 13. I think we'll be able to glean a little bit of something out of this that I think will be very helpful to you. You'll notice the similarity. Beginning in verse 9 of chapter 13 of Mark. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogue. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. See, he's talking about in this generation. That's what he says in verse 30. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. He's saying, look at clearly in verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Then the end will come. Talking about the judgment of Jerusalem. See, the first century church, the charge of Jesus was to evangelize the world in their generation. Look at the book of Matthew. Come on. All right, come on, Dave. Let's get a running start in this passage. Chapter 24, verse 2. Jesus says, Do you see these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the age? And the end of the age. Verse 9. Then you'll be handed over. So he's talking to the disciples right here. Are you catching this right now? Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Now, if you're hated by someone, it's because they know you. The apostles were known by all the nations. Verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Wow. wow. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm in the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. He's saying it's, this is a prophecy of Jesus and no prophecy of Jesus doesn't come true. Amen, church? And he's saying clearly right here, and there's not one commentator that doesn't think the end right here is the end of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And the issue is what Jesus is saying right here. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Paul himself writes in Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, that all creatures under heaven have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, church, as a congregation... We need to believe as Jesus prophesied that the world needs to be evangelized in this generation. Are you with me right here? That's not an optional belief. That was the proclamation in this generation. You know, for a lot of people today, they've wanted to minimize this. Now, if indeed evangelizing the world in a generation is a teaching and prophecy of Jesus Christ... To teach otherwise would be deceitful. That's a very strong statement. 
Why would someone want to teach otherwise? One of the flows that's going through so many churches today is the call to autonomy. That each congregation is self-governing. You say, well, why is that good or bad? Well, basically, to be self-governing is to only look after yourself. An autonomous church produces autonomous disciples. Now, beyond that, though, it's a very important principle. is that there's no way one single church can evangelize the world by itself. We need a collection of churches who share the same dream that are willing to sacrifice whatever it takes of their resources, which basically is people and money, and we pull these together so we can evangelize the world in our day. Are you with me right here? In order for this to have happened in the first century, it took those two things. It took leadership, and it took pooling resources. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Come on, Kip. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, in verse 14, I'm, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you, my dear children. Paul planted church there at Corinth. He's the father of faith. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus. I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, who I love, who is faithful Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church. Why was the first century church united? Because it had a common leadership. It's the same thing he taught everywhere in every church. How? Because he sent those he trained into these churches. Let me tell you something. In, In that day, there absolutely was nothing like what's going on today when preachers have to apply for a job in the church. And people want to take the guy with the best application. Let me tell you something. If you would have gotten Paul's application of being in prison, uh, being hated by all these places, being killed, murdered, uh, murdered, I mean, all, all these things, you would never have hired Paul. But Paul sends into that church Timothy. And he says, you imitate him, as he's imitated me, and that'll fix your problems. Wow, that's challenging, isn't it? That's authoritative leadership. Well, look what he does. Turn to 1 Corinthians 16. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. But we set aside money every first day of the week. Amen? For the Lord's work. Well, right here, Paul actually commanded all of the Galatian churches to do this. So he has authority. Amen. And then he's also commanding the Corinthian church. Why? So they can help the church there in Jerusalem. Turn to Acts chapter 20. In Acts 20, we read in verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back to Macedonia. Watch this. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Berea, Aristarchus and Segundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. See, Paul took the best guys from each church and bonded them together and trained them together and then sent them into this church and pulled them from that church in order to build up a brotherhood. Are you with me right here? See, we need to get a conviction that this is what we need to do if we're going to evangelize the world in our day. I mean... You got to admit, guys, it's been exciting for us to send out 30 disciples, half of them to Honolulu and half of them to New York City. Amen. But, you know, we haven't done this alone. Churches like in Eugene and Corvallis and Chicago and Syracuse, they, they've all helped on out. And because they've helped out monetarily and because they've helped out people-wise, we now have awesome church plantings, not only in Honolulu and New York, but also in D.C. See, God is moving. 
Now that being said, I need to speak to something. As some of you are aware, uh, two weeks ago, the Portland church decided no longer to be a part of the new movement. Now, at that particular time, the leadership that was left said, the reason we're doing this is because we believe in autonomy. We do not want to have to give people and money when someone asks us. Now, does that mean they're lost? No, it doesn't. Does that mean that they may be on a course to drift? Absolutely. But you know, it's why so many disciples have moved here. It's why the Untalons came on down. It's why the Williamsons came on down. It's why Krista placed membership today. They want to be a part of something that's moving. They want to be a part of something that's going to make a difference in this day. They want to be a part of a movement that changes the world in our day. Are you with me here, church? Now, very interestingly, it's, it's interesting to me that when someone makes a decision, it always affects someone. It could be a, de- a decision that affects someone for good or a decision that affects someone for ill. Well, when they heard that the Portland church had backed off, and we now have a new church in Portland, the Remnant Church right, right there, Portland International Christian Church. But when they heard in Hilo that the Portland church had stepped out of the new movement, very interestingly, the biggest giver in the church said, well, I don't want any part of this. I just want to give my money to Hilo. And so he said, well, then I'm going to separate myself. I'm just going to meet alone. Well, in the meantime, I had asked the Hilo Church to help us out in India because we don't have any more money. (laughs) We're supporting Santiago. We've sent out 30 disciples. This is all in the baby church, a year old. And I asked the church in in Hilo if they could give $1,000 a month to support Raja in India. And at first, Evan, the preacher there, said, yeah, bro, I think we can do it. But then when his biggest giver pulled out, he goes, I-, I don't know. Well, then one of the shepherds stepped up and called a meeting. It's a small little group of the five married men. It's 20, 25 disciples there. And he says, guys, listen, this is not right that Raja is doing what he's doing over there in India, and he's not supported. Listen, here's what I'm going to do. Here's my normal contribution. I'm adding 50. What are you guys going to do? Each of them added significantly more money. As a matter of fact, the total amount of money that was added was more than what they were giving in the beginning. We sent word over to Raja that he's now going to be full-time over there in India. And excitingly enough, excitingly enough, when he got it, he got the little email and he wrote me back right after. He says, you know, we got the email and we just, we knew that we were part of a worldwide brotherhood. Both Debbie and I just started to cry to know that we were loved that much. And what's exciting for Hilo? They're the first day on campus. They have eight disciples on campus. They had 19 at their Bible talk. 19 visitors. Is that awesome? You see, when you have a vision to evangelize the world, you're going to want to evangelize locally. But we can't be about a little local community church. I was talking to Luis. Luis and Kathy and I got our thing uh, going for tea time. We meet over at uh, Whittier College. And so we're with all the young people there. And they have all the sports teams come on in right at the beginning. We get there. We're there about 8 o'clock. And I mean to tell you, these all the football players and girls, soccer players, I don't even what other players they had in there. But they just descended like the locust in there. Every table. We're sitting there. A half an hour later, the place was deserted. I go, wow. It is like just a horde of locusts that come in, get all the food, and then leave, you know. But I was talking to Luis, and I said, yeah, the brothers in Hawaii, they they have such great vision because they want to evangelize all the Pacific, especially Samoa. And I said, you know something, I didn't even know that in the olden days, we never put a church in Samoa. And Luis goes, man, we didn't have a church in Samoa? Because you see, Luis is part Latin and, and part Polynesian. And he goes, yeah, I, you know, we need something there. I said, exactly, Luis. The reason you wanted to be on the original L.A. mission team and you moved from Boston was because your mom and dad lived in L.A. And you wanted your mom and your dad, your brothers and sisters to know the Lord. Now, the brothers in Hawaii, they're going, hold it. My my mom and dad and my great-grandpa, they all live down in Samoa. Now, where do you think they want to go plant a church? 
But here's the deal. Think about it. Everybody on every nation, in every island, in every situation is somebody's dad, mom, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, great-grandpa, whatever. Let me tell you something. We got to get to the whole world. Are you with me right here? Church, the charge is simple today from the Olivet Discourse. Don't, don't look at the outside. That can be so deceptive. The Jews were so faked out about where they really stood with God. The beautiful marble, the silver, the gold. Inside it was empty. And in a few years, just as the time of the exile, that temple was leveled, showing that God had left his people and judgment had come. Be people that are transparent. Be people like the widow who gives her bios, who gives her life for God. For that is a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you.